So, here's the last list of saints and sinners for this quarter. We'll finish the career of Richard the Lionhearted and then hear about his bad brother John who was involved against his will in one of the most famous events of the English Middle Ages, the signing of the Magna Carta. Most of the rest of the class will then be spent in France during the great age of Gothic architecture there, during the long reigns of Philip Augustus and Louis IX. We'll see Notre Dame and Chartres, among others, and we'll also hear about some of the more famous scholars of the day, including Peter Abelard and Thomas Aquinas, and finally we'll wind up back in England. So last time at the end of class, we heard how Richard the Lionhearted had been bought by his mother and the people of England for a king's ransom, as it were, from the Emperor Henry VI, and here he is again in front of Parliament, sword raised, ready to go to France and get what he thought was rightfully his from the thieving French. As we also heard, Philip Augustus had returned early from their joint crusade and allied with Richard's brother John had been trying to get everything he could of what Richard claimed. <laughs> Many in both England and France had remained loyal to Richard during his imprisonment. In England, there was William Longchamp, the Bishop of Ely, of whom we've heard, who was, along with Robin Hood and his merry men, I guess, John's main opposition in his attempt to seize power. And in France, there was Mercadier, the Baron of Bainac, the chateau you see in the distance there along the Dordogne River. While we see a little more of this fine place and some other things, we'll hear one of the finest of the troubadour songs, La Chansonnette de Ville, by Giraud de Bournay, whom Donnie puts third on the all-time troubadour hit parade following Bertrand de Bourne and Arnaud Daniel. The title of this song, This is a Bad or Unworthy Song, means that Giraud thinks it's inadequate to express his feelings for his beloved, This is a closer look at Bainac now. And looking up at it from the river. This is the town of Bainac, which still looks medieval enough that you could expect to see Mercadier or Richard come walking right down this street. And here's a view from the Chateau de Bainac looking down at the Dordogne River now. The first place which Richard and Mercadier and their men took back from Philip Augustus was the Chateau de Loche, like Chinon, a great fortress town really in the Loire Valley. The oldest part is the keep at the upper left, which is 12th century. The church is 12th century also, and the chateau proper at the right is 15th century. It surrendered to Richard in three hours. It would take Philip Augustus a year-long siege to get it back once again after Richard's death. <laughs> <laughs> 
This is the 12th century key for Don Jean now. And the interior as it looks today, Richard was generally successful in his war in France, but never saw England again. In 1199, one of his vassals, the Comte de Limoges, who coincidentally had Giraud de Bournay on his staff of entertainers at the time, came into the possession of some gold the peasant had dug up. Richard wanted it, besieged the Count of Chaleurs, and died as a result of an arrow wound. Tradition says he was brought to Chinon by Mercadier and died in the house at the end of this street below the high gatehouse of the chateau above. He was buried like Henry had been and Eleanor would be at the nearby abbey of Fontevraud. This now is Chateau Gaillard above the Seine, northwest of Paris. It's a measure of just how strong Richard's position in France was that he could build this just 50 miles from Paris. Philip is said to have threatened to take it even if its walls were made of iron, to which Richard is supposed to have responded, against him I could hold it even if the walls were butter. But in 1204, it was taken by Philip from not Richard, but John, Known in France as John Luzland or Santerre, John was to have trouble his whole reign with the charge that he murdered Arthur, the son of Geoffrey, his older brother, but John himself had been designated by Richard as his heir before his death. John was in fact to have more trouble than he could handle from many quarters. In 1209 he was excommunicated for opposing Innocent III's ecclesiastical appointees in England, and hit upon the novel idea of giving England to the Pope to get out from under that. No Pope was ever happier to be given a country. Innocent III is the fellow who said, when his lack of attention to church ceremonies was questioned, I don't have time for religion. I'm the Pope. This is the former Abbey of Bury St. Edmunds near London. The idea was that John would then rule England as a fief with the Pope's permission, but this didn't sit well with a lot of the barons, his expensive and unsuccessful attempts to maintain his possessions in France against Philip Augustus, which required unpopular tax increases, also led to more baronial and general discontent that culminated in a revolt of the nobility. In 1214, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Stephen Langdon, and many of the leading barons met here to produce a rough draft of what would become known as the Magna Carta, or Great Charter, which John was compelled to sign or else face the threat of actual deposition. This is the modern monument put up by the American Bar Association to commemorate the signing of the Magna Carta in June of 1215, more or less here at Runnymede, just west of London along the Thames, If you read a translation of the Latin, the document sounds very liberal. The most famous passage reads, No free man shall be imprisoned or outlawed or dispossessed of his property, but by the lawful judgment of his peers or by the law of the land. Later, especially at the time of the Great Rebellion and the English Civil War, it was argued that Magna Carta guaranteed the rights of which it spoke to all men. But although there is some controversy still about the original intent of various passages in it, that's not what the barons seem to have meant when they wrote it up. Free man meant baron to the barons. Magna Carta was revised several times during the reign of John's son, Henry III, and this is a copy of the revision of 1217 in the Bodleian Library at Oxford. 
Earlier English kings had granted rights, usually of a very general sort to the nobility, but Magna Carta includes a long list of specifics, and unlike the earlier examples which were offered essentially as royal boons, Magna Carta was exacted under the threat of force by the king's own people. It came to represent the right of all Englishmen to demand consideration, even from their supposedly divinely ordained and legitimate ruler. Be all that as it may, however, John himself had no intention of living up to the provisions of the charter he had signed, and the Pope pronounced it null and void. This intransigence led John's baronial opponents to seek an alliance with Philip Augustus in an attempt to overthrow him. Rochester Castle and Kent was one of the baronial strongholds in this business, which ironically allowed John to pass as the defender of English liberty against foreign invaders, led by Philip Augustus' son, the future Louis VIII. John himself was able to gather a formidable group of mercenaries, however, including Marge the Murderer, Ivo the Ironhearted, and yes, even Dennis the Menace, the most dangerous of the lot, and with them and others of their stripe, he was able to take this place from the rebel barons shortly before his death in 1216. This is another view of Rochester, inside the keep now. A large French force still remained in the country, but it was clobbered by William the Marshal, acting as regent for John's young son, Henry III, in a battle so one-sided it's called the Fair of Lincoln. And then a fleet of would-be reinforcements, commanded by the French pirate known as Eustace the Monk, was smashed in its turn by Hubert de Burg, who would succeed William as regent in the Battle of Sandwich in 1217, and that was the end of the French effort. up the long reign of Henry III in the fall, but now we're going to return to France. And here on Notre Dame itself, you see a mutilated image of Philip Augustus himself, regarded as the worthless opponent of Richard the Lionhearted by fans of the latter, but thought by the French with good reason to have been one of their most important medieval kings. It's true he was no match for Richard, but few were, and he was much more than a match for John and Henry III. He essentially took everything from John that Richard had taken from him, and Henry III couldn't get anything back. He also built the original Louvre, as well as the wall around the city, which essentially defined its limits on the left bank at least until the 18th century. And in his long 43-year reign, much of Notre Dame was built. This is actually one of three images of French kings, which could be called portraits, that decorate Notre Dame. This is a view of Paris today, looking east. The wall which Philip Augustus built crossed the river in the form of a chain from the Louvre to the old fort called the Tour de Nestle that used to be where the French Institute is now. It then ran around to the south as far as the modern Rue Soufflo, about where the Pantheon is, then northeast more or less along the line of the present Rue Cardinal Le Moyne. There were other chains connecting it to the Ile Saint-Louis and to the right bank where it curved back around to the north as far as Rue Etienne Marcel and so back to the Louvre. This photo then more or less includes the area of medieval Paris. This is a 16th century map which shows you how the walls of Philip Augustus built in the 13th century ran and you can see in 300 years the city hasn't expanded very far beyond them. You can see the old keep of the Louvre at the bottom. Notice that the Abbey of Saint-Germain-de-Prés, now in the heart of Paris, was out in the country, de Pré, as late as the 16th century. Oh, no, je, 
A few years ago, when all sorts of things were being done at the Louvre in conjunction with the building of the pyramid and the expansion of the museum into the north wing, it was discovered that the original foundations of the Philip Augustus Louvre were still down below the surface and in such good shape they looked like they could have been built yesterday. You're looking at the base of the fortifications which would have been underwater in Philip Augustus's day. The moat was where tourists now walk around these remains. The square post was used as a support for the drawbridge across the moat. There are several bits and pieces of the 13th century wall still surviving here and there. This is a piece along Rue des Jardins Saint-Paul on the right bank near the river in the Ile Saint-Louis. I am the Port Saint-Jacques, which was the southern entrance to the city, stood right here in Philip Augustus's day. This is now the intersection of Rue Soufflot and Rue Saint-Jacques, which runs north down the hill of Mont Saint-Geneviève. Looking along uh, Rue Saint-Jacques here, you can see in the distance the Observatory of the Sorbonne, the oldest document referring to the University of Paris, has Philip Augustus's name on it. And it is usually said to have come more or less into existence during his reign, or at least his lifetime. But there is no official date. Its development from the Cathedral School of Notre Dame was a gradual process. The Sorbonne is named after Louis IX's chaplain, Roberta Sorbonne, who founded it. Louis IX's Philip Augustus's grandson. Sorbonne founded it as a theological school within the University of Paris in 1257, but the Sorbonne as a theology school no longer exists. The site is occupied by what are now called, to avoid the taint of the Ancien Regime, universities three and four of the 13 universities into which the University of Paris was divided following the student uprisings of the 1960s. This is the intersection of Rue Galan and Rue Fouard, two of the oldest streets in Paris. As I said, before there was the University of Paris, there was the Cathedral School of Notre Dame, and the most famous man connected with it was Peter Abelard, who seems to have begun his career in Paris around 1103. In the 12th century, the Chancellor of the school granted a license to lecture to those considered qualified, but did not provide a classroom. Teachers were paid by their pupils, and rather than spend money they got, which wasn't much, on hiring a lecture hall, many of them simply lectured outdoors, and this was one of the popular spots right across the river from Notre Dame in the heart of what became known as the Latin Quarter because of this. All teaching was in that language, which made it easy for scholars to move from place to place, Bologna, Oxford, Salamanca, Heidelberg, wherever. Abelard's connection with the Cathedral School of Notre Dame was never, never official, however. He was himself well-educated, but doesn't seem to have cared whether he had a license or not, and his personality was such that he drew great crowds nevertheless. In Abelard's day, the Notre Dame we know had not yet been built, and only a few fragments of the Romanesque church, like these columns in the Cluny Museum, still survive. St. Anselm, uh, about whose ontological argument for the existence of God we heard some time ago, is often considered the founder of what's called scholasticism. The scholastics, and the University of Paris was to become their headquarters in effect, were dedicated to trying to prove Christian truths rather than, although this is an oversimplification, just taking them for granted, as had been usual among early, earlier theologians like Gregory, Jerome, and Augustine. To this extent, they were rationalists, but it's really better to think of them as logicians because the use of the Aristotelian syllogism, not the investigation of phenomena, was their modus operandi. They wanted to establish conclusions by drawing them from premises derived from accepted authorities, primarily Aristotle, the Bible, and the early church fathers. There had, of course, been major disagreements among many of the early Christian writers, which everyone realized, 
But Abelard, in what is today probably his most well-known book, Seek et Non, Yes and No, emphasized the prevalence and nature of these disagreements. Contradictory premises can be found in the accepted sources, even within the same source. In Genesis, it says that man was created in God's image, for example, but St. John says that God is a spirit. What are we to make of this? You're hearing a song now that Abelard wrote called O Quanta Qualia. Because his motto might well have been question authority, Abelard was a controversial fellow, but in 1117 he was given a job tutoring the niece of a canon of the cathedral named Fulbert, who although he wouldn't recognize the area now, lived here beside the Seine, north of Notre Dame. The niece was of course Eloise. Abelard was by this time 38 years old and regarded as one of the most exciting intellects in Paris. Eloise was just 16 and presumably impressionable. In any case, Abelard wrote in his autobiography that this was like the shepherd putting the wolf in charge of his sheep. He says, no matter what woman I desired, I dreaded rejection by none. Talk's cheap, but this was a big challenge to Eloise and she flunked it. She was pregnant within a year. At number three, Rue Volte on the right bank, you can see what is sometimes called the oldest house in Paris, which probably looks something like Fulbert's house did when it was here. Anyway, Eb Eloise and Abelard were secretly married so as not to prejudice any chance he might have had to get a position with the church. Mistresses were often overlooked, wives were forbidden. However, when Fulbert became aware of her pregnancy and she confessed that she had married Abelard, Fulbert was furious and he had him beaten up and castrated, which also meant he had no future in the church which tolerated eunuchs no more than wives. He then became a monk and Eloise became a nun. This is a picture of Eloise and Abelard, although they didn't sit for it. Abelard's main opponents were not the scholastics, he's often considered a scholastic himself with an asterisk, but rather people like St. Bernard who had no use for rationalism. Bernard was maybe more like St. Augustine and the early church fathers who did not take to the idea that in effect Christian truths should be or could be subjected to logical analysis. Abelard became a monk only in a nominal sense, and his career as an intellectual gadfly went on until he was challenged to a famous debate at Sens by Bernard himself. This did not come off, but Abelard was condemned by the archbishop and retired to the protection of Peter the Venerable, another intellectual opponent of Bernard's, as you may remember, at Cluny. It is said that Abelard's bones and those of Eloise now lie in the same grave at Père Lachaise in Paris. Abelard himself once wrote to Eloise, Vel confasus periter moriter feliciter. If we can lie in the same grave, I'll die happy. But that reminds me of Andrew Marvel's lines, The grave's a fine and quiet place, but none I think do their embrace. This is a manuscript of the work called The Sententiae by Peter Lombard, whose picture you see there and who was influenced by Abelard but probably never met him. Peter Lombard was to be the last Bishop of Paris before Old Notre Dame was torn down and rebuilt in a way we'll see about in the Gothic style. In The Sententiae, that is, the opinions, he collected and arranged the opinions of various accepted authorities on all sorts of subjects from angels to devils, grace to sin, heaven to hell, and so on. Some of the opinions he himself drew from these authorities were regarded as a bit unorthodox, but the book was used for centuries 
as a primary source, a, a compendium of authoritative opinions. He is also the last important thinker associated with the Cathedral School of Notre Dame before, in effect, it became the University of Paris. In 1245, Thomas Aquinas, an Italian Dominican monk who had been at Monte Cassino and attended the University of Naples, arrived in Paris. At that time, Albertus Magnus was the most famous teacher there, and important though he is, St. Thomas went on to become the most important of all medieval theologians. The work of St. Thomas himself is sometimes likened to a sort of scholarly cathedral in which a profusion of details is combined and opposing forces are juxtaposed in the creation of an awe-inspiring and balanced whole. In his Summa Theologica, Thomas discusses some 630 questions and presents pro and contra opinions, many drawn from Peter Lombard's compendium, and shows that what might seem to be contradictions are properly understood, not really contradictions at all. True, it says in Genesis that man was created in God's image, and true, St. John says God is a spirit, but the sense in which man is created in God's image is a spiritual sense. Man is like God in spirit, not in form. So there's no real problem. In the pursuit of his purpose, Thomas relied heavily on Aristotle and even on his Arabic interpreter of Arawis, whose commentaries on the, the philosopher, as Aristotle was known, had just become available in Paris. This kind of thing made him some enemies, but his work became the standard source for accepted Christian truth and doctrine, and still officially remains so for Roman Catholics. The Cathedral of Notre Dame, which would have been essentially finished by the time St. Thomas arrived in Paris, was begun by Maurice de Sully, Bishop of Paris and successor to Peter Lombard in about 1163, and so is in the early classic group with Saint-Denis, Sans, and Léon, which we saw last time. It would look more Gothic if it had gotten the pointed spires it was intended to have, but since it got neither one, it at least looks essentially symmetrical, although for some reason the left-hand vertical section of the church is wider than the right, and the portal on the left has an angled, pediment-like decoration over it. It has been suggested that this keeps the facade from being monotonous, but that's not very convincing. Now you're looking up at the facade from directly in front of the church, all of the then surviving standing facade statues were wrecked in the revolution. It may have been thought that the row of kings that used to be where these modern replacements are represented the Bourbons, but they were, as at Saint-Denis, rather biblical heroes. A few years ago, when some plumbing work was being done in the basement of a bank, the decapitated heads of the original statues were found, and this is one of them, now on display in the Clooney Museum. This is the apse, the east end now of Notre Dame. Alan Temko says that these are the earliest real flying buttresses, but Kenneth Clark says they were invented at Chartres, and there are still earlier examples of their use on a small scale here and there. The usual thought is that these buttresses were made necessary by the more extensive use of glass in the 12th century. It doesn't seem unreasonable that if you remove supporting stone and replace it with glass, something else has to hold up the church, therefore the flying buttress was invented. However, some of the most glass-filled Gothic churches don't have them, the Saint chapelle for example. And in England, where the Gothic style produces east ends that are virtually walls of glass, they were never as popular as in France. Statics and engineering are complex subjects. In any case, they came to be part of the Gothic style, whether they were needed to hold up the churches or not. The architects made a virtue of what they may or may not have thought was a necessity. Oh, he's a busy. 
This is the right front portal on the facade now. It contains the earliest part of the sculpture that decorates the church. Most of the work on the other two doors has been heavily restored. At the top of the tympanum are the Virgin and Child enthroned, with on the left from our viewpoint, Bishop Maurice de Sully with his crozier, while on the right side, Louis VII kneels behind the angel. Like Suget, Maurice de Sully was base-born, the son of a charcoal salesman, in fact, and to be allowed to stand before the Virgin's throne while the king has to kneel is about as good as it gets for the son of a charcoal salesman. In the top lintel, the Annunciation, Visitation, Nativity, and Magi are depicted, and this was all done about 1170, and then 50 years later, a second lintel was added below this with episodes from the life of the Virgin's parents, Joachim and Anna, as recounted in the uh, apocryphal Protevangelion of James. This is the nave of Notre Dame now, and you're looking back to the west toward the entrance. When we were looking at the Cathedral of Léon last time, I pointed out that there are several features which characterize the early Gothic period, sometimes called the classic Gothic in France, essentially including those churches begun in the 12th century. One feature is the four-story nave, and although the windows of Notre Dame were enlarged in the late 14th century, and this changed the original look, you can see what the hole was once like from the bay on the far right, which has been reconstructed to show you the original configuration, and you can sort of see an echo of the original wheel-like parts of the wall below the later windows down the wall. On the left, you can see the walkway in the gallery on the second story. The arcade is held up at ground level by big, heavy, single-column piers in the 12th century fashion, too, although, again, small engaged columns were later added to the western piers, and the vault is sexpartite in the 12th century style. Here's the name from ground level. Thomas Aquinas himself wrote the sequence, or at least the text is attributed to him, the sequence for the Feast of Corpus Christi called Lauda Sien Salvatorum, the monophonic chant we've been hearing. And until the 12th century, most liturgical music was monophonic like this. Everyone sang the same words and the same notes at the same time. By the 12th century, however, a style of polyphonic music called organum was becoming popular, and Notre Dame was one of the most important centers of this style. The man whose name is most closely connected with this was, in fact, Leoninus, the choir master of Notre Dame in the late 12th century, and he is, in fact, the first major composer in something like the modern sense whose name is known to us. In his Magnus Liber Organi, he composed settings of the proper of the Mass for much of the liturgical year, although the traditional Gregorian style was still used for the ordinary. We'll hear the hymn Vide Randomnes for January 1st. This music is quite a startling change from the Gregorian chant. Leoninus must have been regarded as something like the Stravinsky of his day, I think. V This is another view of the nave. The nave vault and the choir. the double ambulatory around the choir. The stained glass. 
the south transept rose window, most of the glass here, as in the church as a whole, is modern. This is the north transept rose, which has the most original glass of any window in the church. This now is the Cathedral of St. Etienne at Bourges from the air. The successor to Maurice de Sully as Bishop of Paris was Oude de Sully, who was from the same town as Maurice's family, but who was a member of the noble family of the Dukes de Sully. Oude's brother was Henri de Sully, who was the Bishop of Bourges when this cathedral was begun around 1185. This family connection may help explain some of the similarities between Notre Dame in Paris and Saint Etienne here in Bourges, although they don't look much like one another at first glance. For example, both Notre Dame and Bourges are unusual in having not one but two aisles on either side of the nave, although Bourges is even more unusual then in having five portals where Notre Dame just has the more usual three. Notre Dame also almost doesn't have a real transept. It's very short, and although I don't know that Henri de Sully got the idea it could be left out altogether from looking at Notre Dame. He did leave it out. And the total absence of a transept is, again, very unusual in major Gothic churches. The towers at the facade were never finished. Here's the church from ground level now, and a picture like this gives you a good idea about how such a church dominated the whole city, still does dominate it. Not since the pyramids were built, I think, were whole populations so involved in projects like this. Paris had a population of 100,000 by 1,200, but places like Bourges and Chartres and Reims were more like 10,000, and for decades a very large part of the whole adult citizenry would have been involved in one way or another with something like this. Cathedrals were the focus of the civic and even more, of course, the artistic life of the age. No secular buildings got anything like the care lavished on projects like this. Here's the choir now in which the gallery is reduced to a decoration and the wall has just three stories which will become the standard for the 13th century. The glass in the choir at Bourges is mostly 13th century and is considered second only to that of Chartres in both age and quality. It is especially famous for its reds made from iron oxide, which we know better as rust. And this is one of the noblest uses to which rust has ever been put. We're going to see some more of the glass at Bourges now and hear another piece of early polyphony. Leoninus used two-part harmony and Peritinus, his successor as choir master at Notre Dame, wrote four-part harmony. So we'll hear the same hymn we heard at Notre Dame, Vide Run Omnes, from the proper for January 1st in a four-part arrangement now by Peritinus. <laughs> This window tells the story of Joseph, the son of Jacob. It's interesting that the window was paid for by the Carpenters Guild, and you see carpenters at work in the two bottom sections, even though this is not the life of Joseph the Carpenter, who was the father of Jesus. I don't know how this happened. Either they just got confused or didn't care. Here you can see the carpenters up closer with Joseph having the dream in which the eleven sheaves, eleven stars, and the sun and moon honor him in the way that offended his brothers. This is the St. Thomas window 
Thomas is the patron saint of stonecutters and masons and according to tradition went off to India and became an architect. It's a long story told in the golden legend. You can see a stonecutter at the bottom here. The stories in such windows incidentally are read from bottom to top and left to right. This is the John the Baptist window. Has a portrait of Louis IX, St. Louis. When Philip Augustus died in 1223, he was succeeded by his short lived son, Louis VIII, who was the fellow involved before he became the king in the unsuccessful invasion of England at the end of John's reign. Louis IX here was his son by Blanche of Castile, the daughter of Alfonso VIII, King of Spain, and the granddaughter of Henry II and Elder of Aquitaine a formidable pedigree, and she became one of the most powerful women of the age, beginning with the regency she held during Louis's minority. He was just 12 at his father's death. Her assumption of the regency was opposed by many of the nobility, led by Pierre de Dreux, on the grounds that she was neither French nor a man, but such was her character and will that she was able to get enough support to hold her position. Louis IX is the third king, along with Louis VII and Philip Augustus, to appear on Notre Dame, and you see him here on the left, adoring Jesus and his mother with his inconsequential wife, Marguerite de Provence, uh, on the right. The real woman in his life was always his mother Blanche, but despite this and his reputation for saintliness, he was no mama's boy and could hold his own with any of the heroes of the day. Louis' strong religious faith led him to found about a dozen Cistercian abbeys, including one at Long Pont, 20 miles northeast of Paris. Louis himself was present at the consecration, and a large part of the place still stands. His reign is, however, darkened by the persecution of the Albigensians, who were opposed to the hierarchical and ritualistic side of Christianity, and essentially wanted to return to a simpler, more ascetic life, which they thought more consistent with the teachings of Jesus. We know a lot of details about Louis' life because a friend of his, Jean de Joinville, wrote a biography of him that is still considered a classic. Another abbey which he founded near Paris is at Royaumont. One piece of the Church of Louis' day survives at the left, and you can see what's left of the foundations clearly enough. In one memorable anecdote, Joinville describes how the king asked him if he were going to wash the feet of the poor on Maundy Thursday. Your majesty, said Joinville, I wouldn't touch one of the poor, let alone wash his dirty feet. Well, said the king, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was not above washing the feet of the poor. I'm going to do it, and I think you'd better too. So presumably he did. This is the Chateau d'Angers at the west end of the Loire Valley, and this represents Louis' secular side. He put his brother Charles d'Anjou in charge, and such efforts as this continued to keep the English from getting back what they persisted in thinking was their property in France. In 1242, Louis came down with malaria, and when he recovered, he vowed to go on a crusade. Another thing Joinville reports is that he said that the only way to argue with an infidel was to run your sword in him as far as it would go. The Louvre owns his crown, which you see now. He left on his crusade in 1248, having decided to sail to Egypt and approach the Holy Land from the south. And although he won a Pyrrhic victory at Mansoura, disease broke out in the army. They got lost in the Delta, and he and what many had left were finally captured. He was released on his promise, which he apparently broke, to send a large ransom, and he arrived at length in Palestine. Although he no longer had an army of any size, his visit was not a complete failure. 
He was able, for example, to fortify Caesarea here on the coast with walls that still survive, and he stayed four years, mostly at Acre, mediating disputes in the Christian community and hoping to mobilize a united effort, but when his mother, who'd been left with the regency again in France, died, he returned home in 1254 without ever having seen Jerusalem. In 1270, he made another attempt at a crusade, but died soon after his army landed in North Africa. One of the first things Louis did after his return from his expedition to Palestine in 1254 was go to Chartres and carry some of the building stones for the new cathedral on his own back, a burden that many from nobles to paupers undertook, and you see the result in the distance now, the Cathedral of Chartres, and we'll hear all about it after the break. 